Well, welcome to another episode of the Managing Innovation podcast, and I'm delighted today to have with us Hannes Erler, who's an old friend, and Hannes is also the strat- strat- I get this right, Strategic Director for Innovation Ecosystems uh, from the Swarovski Company. Now, I don't know about you, but for me, Swarovski conjures up pictures of beautiful crystals in jewellery and watches and decorations. Wonderful. But uh, when you go back their 100 plus year history, it's a very different company that you see at the beginning uh, out of deep engineering roots. So it's a fascinating innovation story. And who better to help us understand innovation in that space than Hannes? So, Hannes, thank you so much for joining and welcome. Um Maybe we could start with a a simple question. How did you get here? Can you tell us a bit about your innovation journey with the company and what you've been doing to bring you to the point where you're now responsible for innovation ecosystems? Yes, I would I would like to do so. And thank you for the for the invitation, John. Yeah, uh, I think everything started when I was a young mechanical engineer in the beginning of the 80s. And I started in product development and then I saw very fast that uh, in order to have a future growth, we have to change our things. And I started with an interview with Bob Cooper. Bob Cooper came in this time as well to, to uh, uh, Austria. Mm-hmm. And we started with the first German speaking company with stage gate process. So wow. I thought okay. we have a company that is very innovative, but our processes were not good enough for growth. So with the stage gate, we could, we, we, ha- we have, uh, uh, it was possible for us to, to speed up, to be more predictive, but on the other side, to have diversity and a higher degree of innovation, we I think that was the start of my journey. And, and one part of that journey was that I then was sent to Harvard and I was in the first class from Mr. Sorovsky and I was in the first class of Clayton Christensen ah. when he introduced in 1996 his theory about disruptive innovation. Wow. And this was a big point where I started to think about how can we do that? And at this time, so the company, I would say, developed on concurrently with the research from innovation professors. Mm -hmm. And so that was more or less my journey. And I I was always fascinated by bringing these theories to the company, trying out, learning with the people, integrating the people. And so that that was more or less my journey that that brought me to here. And now I'm getting retired, end of the year, so I'm now working with the company since 43 years, and uh, there's a lot of experiences. And and I fell in love with innovation, and I I cannot think to have a better job than dealing with innovation, learning about innovation, and applying innovation. Wonderful, wonderful. That's a that's a lot of experience, Hannes. But but what I particularly like is the, the the picture of you is kind of looking two ways. You're looking out at what we're learning in the research world and the other wider world about innovation and then bringing it in and translating it into what does this mean for the company, building its yeah, capabilities. Yeah. Um, exactly, it's exactly. And and I would say every company, every strategy and every time has its own, let's say, challenges. Yeah. If I started with StageGate in the 80s and 90s, that was StageGate who brought us forward. But then, uh, let's say, when Clayton, uh, when when Henry Chesbro wrote his book about open innovation, we have been an open innovation company for long, but we did not name it like open yeah. innovation. But then understanding the theory behind brought us to the next level to yeah. say, hey, what yeah. about ecosystems? How do we define this open innovation? Can we afford, do we have to, to bring in more from outside or more from inside? And today I would say it's about, uh, uh, let's say, ambidexterity and doing both yeah. at the same time. Yeah. That's fascinating. And it very much speaks to this idea of dynamic capability. You're constantly adapting. Yes. It's a moving target. But then That's right word. maybe I could pick up on what clearly is part of today's challenge. Um, ecosystems, innovation ecosystems and the strategy for that. This is a multiplayer game. Can you tell us a bit about a day in the life of a, a strategy director for innovation ecosystems? What do you do? What does your job involve? Yeah, it's not easy to describe, but <laughs> no, but it's in, in in fact it's simple. On the one hand, you have uh, on the one side you have to look and to listen to the internal world, 
to your company, to the people, very much to the customers and say, and I would say the most important thing is about trying out the right questions <laughs> from the customers. Yeah. And I would not say we, we do have fast solutions in, in, in our world today. That, that would be very fine, but I think it's hard work to do. So listen to, to what, what is the right questions. And, and I have some examples where we have to listen for more than mm -hmm. 10 years. And then in the sudden, you fall into the answer. And so and the second part of this game is to have a, a, a good view to the outside world mm -hmm. and, and go with open eyes through the technological advancements then, that are everywhere. Mm -hmm. And I would say about this ecosystem, what, what uh, my learning was in the last years, especially as well driven uh, by the, the crisis, is mm. that we have to define our ecosystem consciousness a little more dedicated. What I mean with that is that, uh, let's say, we can divide, let's say, such an innovation ecosystem into a part that is more about uh, business and about bringing the right things to the market. And one is about, uh, let's say, science ecosystems that are exploring, researching and so. And to combine that, yeah. uh, I think it's more uh, iterative process. So you find the question, you go to the science ecosystem, you translate the question, you see, hey, what can we, in our mm -hmm. case, learn from this uh, new technology, and how could we translate this mm -hmm. innovation into the world of fashion and jewelry? Mm -hmm. And it is it's more or less so this disbalancing. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, but in the recent years, I, I would say more we let's say 15 years ago, we more had well, built our development on networks and say, oh, the network and so we talk mm -hmm. about and a, a lot of uh, opportunities came. But today, I would say it's more about dedicated ecosystem, finding the right partners, bringing the right yeah. partners together, yeah. uh, making them collaborating and giving them the right environment and the right process. Yeah. That's yeah. And so I think that's more the, the, the work of a strategic, uh, let's say, ecosystem driver. Mm. And uh, yeah, and, and that's so, so the day is well defined by that. Yeah. Oh, that's a, it's a fairly busy role, I can imagine. And what comes to my mind, it's a little like a football team. It's not just 11 people on a pitch. It takes a lot of helping them, guiding them, shaping them to be a performing unit, even right. though it's quite a lot of different right. players. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's a, a, a very important thing that you are saying. So in my experience, uh, uh, let's say in, in innovation history, we in the 90s and, and uh, zero years, we more talked about the heroes and support the heroes in the company. Mm. Our My learning, and I think as well the learning of a lot of colleagues is be careful with champions and heroes. Because uh, in this networked world, you need always teams. Yeah. yeah. And if you only speak about the one who, who, who at the end uh, brings the ball into the, uh, into the, into the goal, yep. uh, it's dangerous because yeah. the company must grow, the people have to develop, and we have yeah. what we see more and more people with very good education coming from the universities. I must mm. say, I even did not know about when I was a mechanical engineer about innovation management. Today we have dedicated education. So these people come to the companies yeah. and in these companies they want to apply their knowledge, they want to experience their knowledge and to develop forward. Yeah. That needs another system that we had, let's say, 20 years ago. Yeah. So we should rather support them, coach them and, and seeing how can we support and help and how can we bring in the right environment for them. Super. And I'm, that I was, mm -hmm. I, I'm getting this repeated picture of a, a learning company over time. And of course, this company is well over 100 years old. I wonder, yeah. could you just briefly explain how a company moves from uh, where it began to the fashion, jewelry, wonderful stuff it does today? Um, and what that's meant in terms of the innovation challenges? Could you just give us a potted history of, uh, of yeah. Swarovski? I, do, I try to do it very briefly, yeah. and I must say I was I must say I was very surprised. So I was always uh, at the beginning, always was very proud to be in an innovative company, and this was the age of growth. So what we did, we had technology, we had a market, we had a product, 
we had designers, we had a, a fashion industry that needed innovation. So it's very much defined and, and, and we had really an engine, let's say uh, an innovation engine with bringing more than hundreds of products a year. And we had a, a, an idea system that worked and so. And I think uh, then, and one day we had to learn that uh, if we think about the innovation, uh, let's say, uh, innovation strategy of a company and the innovation DNA, we sometimes, uh, in a, uh, let's say, uh, the researchers are saying the innovation uh, strategy or innovation DNA of a company is coined by the first four years of its existence. Hmm. These questions we asked uh, 90 years after the company was born. And, <laughs> and it was a very interesting experience because at this time we did always more of the same, more of the same, doing the, the good, better and so. But then we saw the original DNA was about like a startup in 1895. Mm. was about exploring. So Mr. Swarovski, he, he saw the first electric machines. He brought it to the jewelry industry. He, he automized it. And then, so exploring, experiencing, and delivering. Mm -hmm. That brought us to a new way where we said, oh, with our innovation network. Uh, by the way, at that time, we won the best innovation network award from the Zeppelin University in Europe. Mm. Then, we saw, oh, to be really innovative, we must rather go back and think, can we today be as a big company like a startup? And that's very difficult. Yeah. I, yeah. Today, I would say we have somehow to, uh, to restart with smaller organizations. Mm -hmm. uh, for a big company, it's difficult. We tried it. In some cases, we have been successful, but in some cases, we failed. Yeah. yeah. Very, very big. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And you, as you mentioned, you, you've had 40 plus years of experience in this innovation world, in this growing but learning company. I wonder, could you distill, and it's a very difficult question, um, what you see as the key success factors for innovation? If you wanted to make innovation happen, a uh, recommendation, what would be the key factors associated with success? Yes. Yeah. yeah, I would say the key factor is to know who you are and to know who you want to be. <laughs> it's very, uh, I would say, and this defines the, the processes and the strategy that you have to be there. If you are in a market, if you have uh, that growth, if you are, have a product that is successful, if you have uh, an organization that is well organized for, for growth, then I think it's a, a different thing. But a lot of big companies are showing us how, they, how this works, you know, the big innovators in, in the world, what they are doing. I think today it is, if you then define who want, do you want to grow by innovation, then you have to go for a bigger game, you have to invest, you have to well organize. And I think the biggest thing is in my experience, and if I would, let's say, if I, I would go for another job, I would ask the CEO mm -hmm. if he understands the principles of embed exterity. What I mean with that is, yeah. The leadership team, especially the CEOs, they have to know that uh, organizing day-to-day -day business and innovation are two different games with two different types of people. And uh, they have to know that for people that are on, in the market and, and in production, they have to deliver. So failure is, failing is not allowed there because we are not happy if the wheels of our car turn off. And on the other hand, to have a better car, you have to have people that ex have can experience, that can fail, that love to fail, that mm. are, let's say, that are, uh, they get a bonus for failing. Yeah. And I think what I see in the world, and that makes me a little sad, is that in most of the cases, CEOs are coming from the financial area, and it's very short-driven uh, result thinking, uh, which is, I think, necessary for the survival of a company. Yeah. Mm. And the other thing is about innovation and, and what I learned, and I think that's experience of the last 20 years now as well, is that if you are having under control the big success factors, you have to say, or let's say 70, 80 percent go to the business and where the money comes from today from the customers and let's say around 20, 10, 20 percent go for the radical innovation for breakthroughs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they have to be organized differently, but they have to be managed with under the umbrella yeah. of the company. And that's why I think 
the most important thing is that CEOs understand these principles of ambidextivity. That's really interesting, and, and it it plays out just as much in the uh, the public sector and not for profits as it does in large uh, commercial organisations. Um, I wonder if I could then flip the question slightly and uh, ask you now to play the role of the the devil's disciple or something similar. You know, your job is to recommend something to a company which will guarantee innovation won't happen. So I want you to think of the big things that might be associated with making sure innovation doesn't happen. Any thoughts about that? <laughs> Organize your company in silence. Uh-huh, okay. Forbid the people to work cross-functional. <laughs> That's interesting. Uh, getting relaxed and saying, we have a good product, we have a good business, so the world is good, we do not have to change. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then, uh, yeah, to... to yeah, to let the people think that they are safe. I think we have to be honest to the people. And if you don't, if you are not honest, if you lie on the people, and if you say, uh, if you do not tell the truth, I think that will be the, yeah. the start of a failure in innovation. Yeah. No, those resonate, especially the, the organizing into silos. I think one lesson we've learned is how important it is to have inside as well as outside the organization those conversations. It really is about open innovation, about networked innovation. Yes, yes, really. Yeah. Um, Hannes, a lot of people who listen to this are interested in innovation management as a career. Many of them are students studying in various ways, uh, as you did once when you were in your Harvard days. Um, so maybe if you could look back, and perhaps I could ask you to be Uncle Hannes for a moment, and, uh, <laughs> and, and give some words of advice to somebody who's just about to start a career in innovation management. What lessons might you pass on? Yeah, but so my recommendation would be first of all congratulations if you go the world uh, the the way of uh, innovation, you always will be motivated and be keen for the new. Uh, but I think uh, life is a a lifelong journey of learning and experiencing, and I think it's not easy to find where your personal contribution may lie, but. I believe that everybody of us has somehow a vision and a dream. If I look back when I was 20, when I was 17, a lot of these visions are still here today. I would say now, stay with that vision and, and try to find an environment where you can live with that vision and where, the, where you can make a contribution. And I think uh, to maximize your contribution could be one sense of life. And today I would say, Go to the places where you can contribute to the planet factors, mm. that sustainability, and where you can contribute to the factors that are more about social living and social uh, mm. intercollaboration and so. Yeah. So to, go, to find those places, to go to those places, make your best contribution. And I'm sure if you are the type of an innovator, you will you will have a happy life with that, even if it's not the most easiest way. I must say. Fascinating, fascinating. And this maybe one last tailpiece question. Uh, what's next? Um, you mentioned that you're coming up to retire, but I'm sure you're not going to stop innovating. Uh, I'd love no. to know what you're <clears throat> going to do next and maybe a few thoughts of where you see the company going next as an innovator as you, uh, 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 as you look forward into the future. But what's next? Yeah, so for me personally, next is that I, I really... Uh, I found my way and I would like to contribute and where, see where, where can I help young people, where can I help organizations in order to, to learn from my experience and that is why I want to write a book about that experiences. Oh, great. That will be in English and it will come out, uh, it will last until end of next year, so next year is the writing right. phase. I have a lot of chapters in my mind and I say <laughs> every, every day of life is one new contribution to that chapter. And uh, yes, and, and I think that that makes sense for me and for the company, I would say there are some, uh, I would say from the, from the innovation ecosystems, there are some weak signals of technological change. I think we are well organized for that. We, we are very much dealing with that. And the second thing is we have a clear strategy. Uh, we have a strategy to, to grow in the luxury market. It's our luxury, nice strategy. And I'm sure that we are well organized for that. 
And uh, so it will be a little less complex than we have in fast where we have been more diversified. But I think at the moment it's the right way the company is going and, and I'm sure there will be innovations that you see in the shops all the time. Lovely. Hannes, it's been fascinating talking with you and sharing some of your experience. It's been like a, a little taster, a trailer for the book, which uh, I will be fascinated to read <laughs> if you can capture that uh, that experience. But but for now, thank you so much for sharing your time with us. Uh, and uh, if people want to find out more about Swarovski, they can, of course, have a look at the website. There's a lot of very interesting stuff there. Mm -hmm. But thank you so much, Hannes, for, for yeah. your time. Thank you very much, John, and all the best for the students. Thank you. Thanks.